thank you very much for joining us in person or online tonight. Um, this is our semi-virtual community lecture series as we all are navigating how to come back into the real world after the last 20 months or so. We are really pleased tonight to have um, actually two terrific lecturers um, who uh, I think are going to give a great presentation tonight. Before we talk about that, um, I just want to finish my welcomes. Of course, thank Kyle Good, who's at the back of the room and obviously made all of this happen. Brian Cummings, of whom all electronics are terribly frightened. He can just look at something and make it work. If you have problems at home, let us know. We send him out for hire. Um, he also organizes our community outreach program, which is great. Judy Beck is our director for communications. She couldn't be here tonight. Um, and with that, I just want to highlight, I'm uh, on a very short program tonight because I really think um, there might be some interesting questions for our presentation, not that there aren't always uh, from our interactive audience. Just want to highlight how can you help? How can you be involved with the center? Sign up for our newsletter. Follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, go to our homepage. I'm going to show you that in a second because our, our October newsletter is up. Um, and of course, research you know, drives certainly our economy in California. We're very grateful to have you all interested in this series. But of course, we need your support as well. So think of us um, as you're considering making uh, philanthropic gifts. This is our current uh, website. I just really want to highlight that you can find here our recent recorded lectures if you want to send that on to anyone who might be interested. And um, we have quarterly newsletters now. Our most recent one, which is for October, is up and live on this website. So I invite you to go there and take a look at what's happening in the center. I also want to call out a couple of save the dates, which are important. January 11th at 7 o'clock, our regular timing, it's a Tuesday coming back from the holidays. We are glad to welcome Lee Turner, who is a new recruit as a faculty member. He's at the back of the room. Give us a wave, Lee. You'll show up on the Zoom, in fact. Um, we're really excited to bring Lee here from University of Minnesota because he studies ethics and stem cells combined. He has lectured um, for our scientific audience, our faculty audience at UCI several times, which is why we snatched him away from the middle. Um, and he has come here as a professor of public health and to direct a new center for bioethics. He's going to be speaking on the American stem cell cell. He just had a big uh, publication accepted in um, cell stem cell, which is, I think, coming off embargo on Thursday. Um, and one of the things that he works on is how US businesses are marketing stem cells and unlicensed and unproven um, therapeutics. So this is a really great one to catch, and I invite you all to participate. Again, you can register on our website and at the same site. I also want to call out a save the date um, to the evening, the big evening lecture that we do every year. Unfortunately, last year, of course, it was completely virtual. This year, we're angling for a hybrid mode, so we will be hosting an event events permitting at the Irvine Barclay Theater. Um, that's going to be Thursday, January 27th um, at 7 o'clock in the evening. These are really great events. Anthony Atala is our um, keynote lecturer and our evening public lecturer. He has an incredibly stellar career in stem cells and bioengineering. And so I invite you to have a look at this on the website. And um, please consider registering and attending in person, because we hope that's going to be a great one. With that, I just want to introduce briefly Tim Downing and Mike Zaragoza. Who's going first? Uh, we both Excellent. These, that's Mike's theme. Um, so Tim Downing and Mike Zaragoza. Tim um, is, uh, I think, probably in the, the tenure pile right now. Yep. Wish him luck, everyone. He came here uh, with a bachelor's from Northwestern University. Interesting tidbit about that. He actually was an undergraduate researcher in a laboratory that uh, Brian and I have collaborated with for almost the last 17 or 18 years, which is, just shows you how small the circle in science can be. He went on to get his PhD from UC Berkeley and did a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard. He came to us in 2016, and he has a number of distinctions to his name, including Forbes 30 Under 30, and uh, he's been named as an NIH uh, New Innovator Award. Um, and so we're really pleased to have him here at UCI. He's been incredibly successful. Mike Zaragoza has awards that are actually too numerous to enumerate here, particularly for teaching. This is something that is uh, 
he really excels, excels at in terms of the medical curriculum here. And he's a trained geneticist and uh, uh, MD, PhD. So he's been a wonderful addition to UCI where he um, arrived, I can't see your line, when did you come? Two thousand. There you go. Right after receiving apparently his MD and PhD from Case Western, he works on patient-derived induced pluripotent stem cells and studies um, the genetics of inherited cardiovascular disease and how we can work towards therapeutics in that regard. So, a couple of quick words on format with those brief introductions. Mike and Tim are going to go ahead and give their presentations, clearly going to be a very interactive one since they're organized and going simultaneously. I'm going to ask everyone to hold your questions until the end. It'll be possible to submit questions from the audience who's online through the Q&A box. We'll be monitoring that. I'll be looking at it on my screen. People will potentially be shouting out questions to me to make sure that we're getting those answered as well. And of course, everyone in the audience here tonight, um, we're really glad to have you participate. Thank you for your patience. All right. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, this is actually one of the first lectures I've given live uh, since uh, pre-pandemic. So uh, thank you. And uh, Tim and I, uh, we've known each other for many years and actually a collaborator. So uh, this is going to be uh, fun for us. And you know, Tim, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I have to say that we've already stopped the hands of time because this is a picture several times. And one more time, because this is a picture of me about 12 years ago. Okay. <laughs> he finds that funny. That was not supposed to be funny, Tim. Uh, and, and how old were you uh, in this, or how long ago is this picture for you, Tim? This is the assistant professor year one. Uh, six, years Six years when you were, uh, not too stressed and energetic coming into the system here. Anyway, so we're gonna go over stem cells and aging. And uh, uh, why would we really wanna talk about this topic? Certainly it's very important, okay? Because uh, this topic affects, uh, you know, our life, our lifespan. And just going into some of the data from the CDC, this is a graph uh, that you might've seen. It shows on the bottom the year as well as the age uh, on the other axis, and then it plots out uh, the U.S. life expectancy at birth. So this is the average lifespan that you would expect at birth. And just for comparison, you can see it at, in 1900, that age was 47 years of age. And uh, so just with 100 years, in two, at the uh, year 200, that jumped up all the way to 77 years. So that was a dramatic increase in life expectancy. And certainly, as you know, that was due to uh, public health and also uh, a medicine for infectious disease. But you can also notice here on the more current graph that shows from two, uh, year 200 to 2020, the last 20 years, it's going from 77 to about 79. So we haven't made that much gains over the last 20 years. And uh, the reason behind this is the shift uh, from infectious disease to chronic diseases. So we haven't made much of a gain. And of course, if you update the slide all the way to year 2020, you actually see the dip, okay? And this made a lot of news because of course, what we're all dealing with, okay? But the point is that over the last 20 years, we made some progress, but still, lifespan is still limited. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna talk about, uh, first of all, what is aging? Uh, Dr. Downing is gonna talk a lot about st uh, stem cell epigenetics. Uh, how do we measure aging? That is, how do we study aging? And then finally, we're gonna go into, into some examples of possibilities of how to treat aging. First of all, to start off, uh, I just wanna ask everyone well, what is aging, first of all? So we're, if, just so we're on the same page, what do you think about when you think about aging? A decline. A decline, definitely. What else do you think about? Uh, what happens when you age? Who ages? Any thoughts? Oh, who's aging here? Uh, I'm raising my hand, okay. Uh, Tim. What are your thoughts about aging? Yeah, I think it's a function of the time of the body. 
Exactly, right, thank you. He saw the slides. I, and, you know, so aging is a process, and I'm going to go through some of the medical definitions, okay? But there, in, uh, we do have a lot of thoughts about this, but in general, the definition of aging is a functional decline of the human body, okay? And what is the human body? The human body is made out of cells, okay? This is the basic uh, building block. It's like the bricks of a building, okay? And these are the functional units that make up the human body. And then from these cells, uh, they're grouped together uh, to sh with a shared function for tissues. And then there are more complex structures called organs that also do uh, specialized structures. So this slide shows how, you know, during development, you start as one cell all the way into a very complex individual, the human body, which is actually made up of over 50 trillion cells. And then over 200 different cell types. So these cells are very specialized, as listed here. And they're mature. Most of them do uh, very specific functions. So these are heart cells, skin cells. And then as we age, unfortunately, there's a functional decline in the cellular process, the tissues, as well as the organs. And this is a natural process that we would term aging. But I also want to bring up the question, is aging a disease? No. no. Who here says aging is not a disease? Just to show hands. And that's pretty much the majority. Okay. And why is that? What is that? Why would you say that? Okay. Because this is actually a very controversial topic when you talk about this uh, is it a disease or not? Why is it not a disease? It happens to everyone, absolutely. Any other thoughts? It's a natural process. It's a natural process. So at least medically, we define disease as an abnormal process, OK? So uh, you'll see a lot in medical li literature as aging as defined as a natural process that, whether you like it or not, happens to everyone, OK? So when I think of aging, I think of What's one of the first signs of aging? Losing your hair. <laughs> and what else? <laughs> I, I think of vision, OK? You know, this is where uh, my vision, the lens get thicker, so you can't focus on objects which are close. I refuse to wear bifocals. You know, but still, uh, you know, that's one of the signs of aging, the function of decline. So these are natural changes that we can go through every system uh, where some are actually, uh, you know, early signs of aging. Others, uh, you know, seem to more stable. Now, the second point, whether or not aging is a disease. So most of the time you'll see it's treated not as a disease, okay? But there's also the flip side is that, well, if, it, if you treat as not a disease, then should we treat it, okay? I mean, should we investigate it, okay? And I think the reasons to investigate aging is not that it's a disease, but it's a, a, a known factor for increased risk of chronic, excuse me, chronic diseases. So if you don't think of it as a disease, it's certainly associated with chronic diseases. So in this slide, this is a cohort which shows uh, age in years in the bottom, and then the incident rate of different chronic diseases in a population. And uh, it shows just the different types of chronic diseases uh, associated with aging. And that's uh, from the top, cancer, heart failure, COPD, which is like emphysema, chronic bronchitis, uh, myocardial infarction or heart attack, stroke, dementia, and diabetes. So these are age-related diseases that as the population is aging, the incident increases actually exponentially. Uh, this is on a log scale. So you can also notice as we get aged, as you would expect, that the mortality rate is also increasing at the same rate. You know, so the point of this is aging is one of the main factors of chronic diseases. Okay, so if you don't think that if, uh, if you don't think aging is, is a disease, it certainly contributes to as a factor for chronic diseases. 
and then uh, other things. So we like to study aging, not just because, you know, uh, certainly want to extend health, health, health span, but also understand how aging contributes to different chronic diseases, especially other ones listed on this slide, like osteoporosis, stroke, arthritis, sarcopenia, which is muscle wasting, uh, changes in your vision, vascular disease. So uh, next thing I want to talk about is what causes aging. Now, uh, this is a very uh, broad and deep topic because it's been subject to a lot of different res research. So uh, some of the hallmarks of aging are listed on this slide. And the ones that we're going to focus on tonight are uh, stem cell exhaustion, which uh, essentially is as you get older, your stem cells burn out. Okay? And the other thing that Dr. Downing will go into more detail is something called epigenetic alterations. That is the changes of your DNA that contribute to the aging process. Uh, so back to the side with the tissues and organs and how does this change with age? Certainly we have uh, trillions of cells that make up tissues and organs and most of these are mature specialized cells but how do the, these tissues and organs replenish themselves? So this is a slide uh, that shows the different types of what we call adult or tissue stem cells that uh, uh, are not, uh, are, are less mature and they have a certain ability to uh, renew the cells within that tissue organ. And uh, so what happens during aging? And you've probably heard this uh, uh, attending some of these uh, lectures. What is the definition of stem cells? And this shows for these tissue-specific stem cells, or adult stem cells, uh, there are these quiescent, dormant st stem cells. And then a stem cell is defined by two characteristics. One, its ability to self-renew, that is, divide and then replace itself. And then number two, once it's activated, its ability to differentiate. That is, you have this very immature cell and becomes more specialized. Uh, and then these can give rise to other progenitor cells and then eventually differentiate and become highly specialized and mature. You know, so for example, uh, for your uh, blood cells, uh, you have hematopoietic stem cells in your bone marrow and then the blood cells last roughly, I think, about 120 days. So uh, as those get old, the blood, it has, to, it has to be renewed. So your stem cells would be which are initially dormant, would be activated, self-renew, and then differentiate into the different lineages, the mature cells in your blood. Not only your red blood cells, but also your white blood cells. So in that sense, uh, uh, this system allows you to replenish those cells that have a limited c capacity uh, you know, to age. Uh, now, uh, this is the concept of tissue homeostasis. So as we get older, uh, this allows us to replace the cells that die. It also allows us to uh, be resilient. That is, if there's stress or injury or infection, it allows the body to recover uh, by having this sort of uh, backup cells that could uh, uh, not only self-renew, but also replace those cells which are injured or dying. Uh, so there's this balance or homeostasis. Now, what happens with aging? Now, in aging, uh, these stem cells can undergo many different changes. That is, they can stop uh, dividing, they can uh, not able to self-renew or replace uh, themselves. Uh, they can be failed to be activated. Uh, there's also processes called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, and then also process where they just would stop dividing or senescence. Now, uh, now, this picture uh, you know, shows that process as we age, uh, but also remember this is not in isolation. Not just the stem cell itself is important, but also the local env environment of the tissue and organ that's also gonna be able to allow this process to uh, continue. So as we age, we're actually losing this uh, backup system, the homeostasis, uh, uh, which results in the functional decline. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so back to human cell. Uh, 
well, why does this occur? And uh, so I'm going to bring you back to human cell and uh, show you one of the compartments of the cell, which is called the nucleus. And uh, going into some of the biology, a very simplified slide, as, as you remember, uh, the cell contains a nucleus, which contains the blueprints. That is the DNA, the genome. Uh, the genome is comprised of uh, the chemical called DNA, which is packaged into different uh, uh, segments called chromosomes. So you could think of the DNA as the blueprint, chromosomes as the books, and this gives us the instructions, excuse me, that is the genes, uh, which are over 20,000 different genes that are then translated into proteins to uh, carry out the functions of the cell. And the cell is very mature, so you can imagine uh, different genes are activated uh, you know, to allow the specialized functions for each of those cells. Now, this is a very simplified uh, you know, diagram known as the central dogma. And then here I'm gonna uh, kind of uh, hand this over to Tim because he's gonna go into a more uh, complicated process called epigenetics. Awesome, thank you, Mike. I think everybody can hear me okay. <clears throat> so, like Mike was mentioning, uh, this sort of picture of the central dogma, my lab is very interested in sort of this central question, which is how do a, a single genome, knowing all the cells in your body have the same genetic material, the same ATCG sequences, how does, how, do that, how does that single genome beautifully give rise to all of the cellular heterogeneity that exists within uh, our bodies? And the field is, is really starting to understand that um, a, a large way in which this is accomplished is through what's called epigenetic regulation. And so epigenetics refers to modifications that happen, as the name suggests, on top of or epi on top of the genome um, and include things like uh, histo modifications that are within nucleosomes that wrap around DNA. Uh, these modifications play a big role in the accessibility of certain genes in the genome and whether they can be read out and expressed ultimately giving rise to that protein function that uh, allows those cells to specialize. Also DNA methylation, which is one that we'll focus particularly on today, and I'll, I'll explain what DNA methylation is. Um, but I just want to highlight back to this point that Mike made about stem cell replication um, and how replication itself actually seems to play a big role in the way stem cells are moving through different states or during the differentiation process. And what's always remarkable to me is that these cells need to replicate their DNA sequences to copy and make two cells, but they also need to replicate their epigenetic landscape, all the DNA modifications that are there, the histones, the modifications to those histones, in order to remember which genes to keep on and which genes to keep off to sort of maintain fates. And this, thing, this, this process of replication can actually um, help, again, these stem cells move through different states. And so here's sort of a classical example of what's referred to as asymmetric cell division, where during division of a stem cell, it can give rise to two different types of cells during differentiation, or obviously self-renew. But also there's population level heterogeneity within stem cells that are cell cycle dependent. So if you take a population of stem cells, and you expose a single cue to those stem cells, they all don't do the same. They don't behave in sort of a deterministic fashion where all of these cells commit to the same fate. They actually have different programs of activation based on uh, some type of intrinsic heterogeneity that exists within the stem cell population. Um, at the same time, replication is known to drive the process of aging, okay? The sort of replicative aging, as it's called, one of the sort of more, more uh, familiar examples that you might be familiar with uh, is with telomere shortening. So the chromosome ends um, uh, get shorter as cells replicate, okay, and this can contribute to genomic instability and ultimately facilitate this aging process. My lab is very interested in um, how epigenome replication actually contributes to these seemingly disparate processes of life both allowing and enabling stem cells to differentiate and give rise to all of that beautiful cellular heterogeneity that exists within your body, but also how it might confer susceptibility to um, drift or uh, basically the accumulation of errors in the epigenetic landscape as we, as we age. 
Okay, and so we theorize that temporal delays in epigenome replication serve really two functions. They give rise to regulatory variation, and so noise effectively, um, and, and so like I mentioned, that intrinsic variation. Yes? Sorry. No problem. I'm just wondering if you could explain for a moment about what you mean by cellular heterogeneity. Yeah, so what I mean by ce cellular heterogeneity, right, is that um, if you have a population of cells, okay, all the cells don't have the same molecules within them, okay, and the same modifications to those molecules within them. There's variation across all of the cell population, and so that actually is what is I'm referring to as heterogeneity. Um, I hope that... So if you have skin, mm -hmm. That is one part of heterogeneity, yep. yep. And the other part of heterogeneity is that even in what we think of as a homogeneous population of stem cells, like embryonic stem cells, there can be slight variations between those cells as well that we don't fully understand, um, but that our lab has been exploring that can actually play a big role in the function of how stem cells actually differentiate. Great, thanks for the question. So. Looking back at this sort of picture, you know, and thinking about the duality of replication and how it's serving these two um, sort of purposes, we're going to talk today about DNA methylation, one of these critical modifications in the epigenetic landscape um, that actually is responsible for things like gene expression and gene regulation, but we'll see has a big, is, is largely implicated in the aging process. <laughs> so uh, when I say DNA methylation, I'm essentially referring to this chemical modification that happens on the cytosine molecule of DNA, so A, T, Cs, and Gs, this is this modification, but the more important thing to take away is that actually there's 56 million uh, sites in the genome uh, that ha uh, can have some uh, methylation mark, okay? So it's a location in the genome where it can have some uh, DNA methylation, and 45 million of them will have some level of, of methylation mark present um, in your genomes. Okay, and so just to give you a sense of when I say to copy this information, these cells have to copy 45 million sites uh, where methylation exists. So there's a, quite a bit of work that has to be accomplished um, for these cells to inherit. So thinking about DNA methylation in the context of aging, I think what's uh, sort of one of the more uh, notable things that DNA methylation allows us to do is actually to measure and get a sense of measuring biological age. So here's a plot of sort of a schematic of showing chronological age on the x-axis, but on the y-axis we're showing an estimation of population level averaged age um, in the blue line here with chronological age, and you get some age estimation. And some people who age faster actually fall above this line, okay, and people who uh, age more slowly, fall below this line. Okay, and this can be, again, predicted based on, say, blood signatures in DNA methylation taken from a biopsy. Some of you may be familiar with companies that actually will give you your um, epigenetic clock age based on DNA methylation from your blood or other samples. So in my lab, we are very interested in actually studying and using human embryonic stem cells as a model to understand this process of replication um, and how epigenome replication might contribute to these two different processes of uh, cell fate and also to aging. Um, how we measure DNA methylation, we, we schematize it by just showing open and closed circles saying, for a given location, there's methylation present or absent in a given location. And so this again is sort of giving rise to some of that heterogeneity um, that I mentioned across stem cell populations. Uh, from Eileen's question. And so, in terms of, you know, replication and maintaining epigenetic modifications across replication, uh, DNA methylation happens most frequently in a C followed by G context, and it has this what we call palindrome-like structure, because we know that C's and G's base pair um, with each other, and so there is this position of, where the cytosine exists on both sides of the DNA strand. One strand, both strands can have a methylation mark. 
And as DNA replication happens, okay, again, when I mentioned that inheritance, you have this substrate where the parental strand has methylation information um, that the daughter strand does not, and that information can be transferred through an enzyme that recognizes that substrate, DNA methyltransferase 1, okay? And so this DNMT1 enzyme will find that substrate and add methylation to the other side. Okay, and in this way, across replication, you actually have a closed loop system where DNMT1 is bringing uh, what is a hemimethylated strand of DNA after replication and back into a fully methylated state. Okay, and so this ends up being really important in thinking about replication and how it can propagate and how methylation modifications can propagate uh, across replication. So again, cells can remember which genes to keep on and which genes to keep off. So the, the timing of this process was not very well understood. And so during uh, my postdoc, we actually started some work to develop a method called Repli bisulfite sequencing. Long story short, it's a method that allows us to label newly replicated strands of DNA and capture and measure DNA methylation levels in those newly replicated strands over time. Okay, so we can see how methylation is reestablished in replicated strands of DNA over time. And with that technique, we were able to see that um, actually there are massive delays. The purple line is showing um, our newly replicated DNA, and the gray line up top is actually showing matured, fully matured DNA. And so there's about a, um, this actually shows a little bit better, about a four hour to, to a 16 hour delay in the time that it takes for methylation to hit its steady state after um, it's being replicated. And so this blue plot on the side actually shows that what we actually hope to do with this information is actually to understand, well, there are some locations in the genome that are remethylated very quickly and come up very fast. Others may, whoops, <coughs> come up more slowly. And we're wondering, can they have some implication or some impact on the regulation of genes, but also on the susceptibility of the epigenome uh, to accumulate errors uh, throughout many cycles of replication? So in the context of uh, regulating gene expression, <coughs> One thing that we wanted to look at is actually regions of the genome that are slowly remethylated versus regions that are more quickly remethylated and ask, is there any relationship between the variation in gene expression that we observe across stem cell populations uh, for these two locations? <clears throat> and the interesting thing is that when we actually do some computational sort of analyses, we can see that genes that have very large single cell variation or variability shown in the red actually have slower or the slowest remethylation kinetic rate shown on the y-axis. If you look at cells with low cell to cell variation, they actually indeed also have higher or faster remethylation rates. And so the longer that these cells exist in this post-replication delay for a given gene around that locus, you actually see more uh, variation in the actual expression of the genes near where those slow kinetics are, suggesting that there is indeed some connection between these post-replication kinetics and that functional readout. And so back when Mike was talking about that central dogma, <coughs> what is starting to emerge in the field is that molecular variation or heterogeneity is very central to all levels of the central dogma, okay? Um, you can see this at the protein level, where there's protein level variations between two pluripotency markers, also at the RNA transcript level, and even at the level of the epigenome in the sort of regulatory components of um, the genomic landscape. And so we think replication actually serves as this source of molecular variation across stem cell populations. Why is this useful? Well, <coughs> stem cells really need to um, make fate decisions, not just in deterministic fashions, right, where one cue does one thing to all of the cells they actually can achieve things like probabilistic differentiation strategies where a single cue can actually help a stem cell to differentiate into maybe three lineages where 30% of the time it'll differentiate towards fate A, 60% of the time towards another fate B, and maybe another 10% of the time self-renew. And this allows stem cells to give rise to complex tissue compositions that can then uh, lead to self-assembly and, and remodeling that can lead to complex organ formation. 
Um, and so this is one reason why we might have this intrinsic heterogeneity or variation across stem cell populations. So I mentioned this first part, you know, what we think of as this source of, of regulatory variation and replication. The second part is uh, it conferring susceptibility to drift in the epigenetic landscape throughout the lifespan. And so here's a, 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 some, a data picture from a paper uh, showing actually methylation of chromosome 8 across the whole length of chromosome 8 on the y-axis, again, that methylation level in a newborn individual shown in the purple versus a centenarian, someone who lives to be 100, over 100 years of age, 103 in this case. And what you can see is that there's a global loss of methylation uh, between these two individuals. And so this generally happens across all of our um, methylomes. If we were to take blood from everybody now versus six months from now, you would actually observe some losses in methylation as you um, are sort of aging. And so <laughs> back from this motto of, that I showed you of this closed loop system where DNA methyltransferase 1 brings hemimethylated DNA back into a fully methylated state, you can imagine a scenario where if DNMT1 doesn't have enough time to find that hemimethylated substrate before the next round of DNA replication, actually you have something called passive demethylation where that nascent strand, what was the nascent strand, is now the parental strand in the next round of replication, and there's no methylation on that strand to inherit to the daughter strand, and so the methylation marks are fully lost. And so the idea is that as you're copying, you have this possibility for the accumulation of errors in regions that are very slowly remethylated um, across DNA replication. <coughs> and so just to kind of bring it home, in our data, what we're seeing is that regions with increasing delays in post-replication methylation, so the largest delays here, actually are the locations that we also find have the greatest differences between young and old individuals in these blood cells. And so we can see some signature um, in DNA methylation that uh, slow remethylation rates indeed leave uh, CPGs more susceptible to uh, losses throughout the lifespan. And so from a schematic perspective, we believe epigenome replication is sort of a two-sided coin, okay? On one side, it gives rise to regulatory variation, right? That gives rise to those variations in gene expression allowing stem cells to do important tasks like probabilistic stem cell fate decision-making. But it also leaves our uh, genomes susceptible to drift, the accumulation of errors throughout the lifespan across many sort of cycles of replication. An interesting uh, study also observed that, you know, epigenetic drift, how much of it is a, is a driver of the aging process? A fascinating plot actually shows that different species will have different rates of epigenetic drift. And what you'll see is there's a linear correlation between the maximum longevity or the number of years that species lives and the rate at which their epigenomes drift. And so in the case of mice, they live the shortest, they have the fastest rate of change in methylation um, uh, with, you know, based on time. Monkeys are second, and then humans live the longest, and we have the slowest, and there's a pretty strong R-square correlation between, um, again, this rate of remethylation and how long that species actually lives. <coughs> so what might drive this? So we actually have some interest in some work looking at um, the impact of unmethylated DNA on our immune system. So you may be familiar with this term called inflammaging. Essentially, as we age, our immune system experiences this chronic low-level grade sort of inflammatory state that gets progressively and more progressively worse as we age. We also have immune cell receptors that recognize unmethylated DNA, unmethylated CPG DNA. We tend to think of those receptors as uh, being for recognizing bacteria or viral genomes because they don't have CPG methylation in those species. But as we age, our DNA actually becomes progressively more hypomethylated, as I've shown, and we think that this actually uh, makes the uh, immune system's response to our, our self molecules, our DNA molecules, outdated as we age. It no longer sees it as self, and it starts to look at it as foreign and triggers this sort of inflammatory response. Um, so this is something we're actively interested in, how we might connect epigenetic drift to the actual aging process. 
And then I'll just finish by saying, uh, you know, some theories on aging argue that aging emerged early in evolution as a means of controlling population size. And this is why we're really interested in this work, because um, you can imagine that if you have some population living in a local environment and resources can renew, but they're being consumed by the inhabitants of that uh, environment, uh, and without an aging mechanism, you consume all your resources, your population would crash out, and then you wouldn't really take the next evolutionary step. But with an aging mechanism from a population level sense, it actually allows you to achieve a sort of ecological steady state, right, with your environmental and environmental resources. And so this could be um, one reason why evolution might have picked regulatory mechanisms that actually promoted also the process of aging. Okay, and this is sort of one of my favorite quotes uh, from Teschendorf. In our ancestral species, natural group selection could have favored genetic and epigenetic mechanisms that actually promote the aging process. Um, not to be so negative about the outlook of this talk, but now <laughs> uh, Mike will tell us some things about uh, possible treatments. So what are you trying to say there? Uh, so uh, uh, we've gone into some of the mechanisms associated with epigenetic changes in aging. Uh, now I just want to show some of the evidence that well, how do you know these epigenetic changes as we age actually, you know, has, is, is associated or causative of aging? So one of the biggest uh, findings uh, in most recent years is cellular reprogramming. And this is a process uh, in which you can actually create stem cells. So Tim had mentioned about embryonic stem cells very early on, how those can be, uh, you know, go from an immature state to differentiate into many different cell types. Uh, I talked about a little bit about adult stem cells, which everyone has that helps to replenish those cells in your organs. Well, induced pluripotent stem cells was a good find, a fantastic finding by the Yamanaka group because this is where you could take a mature differentiated cell that is an adult cell, which has all those epigenetic marks, and then reprogram it, actually change it genetically with different proteins to reset the epigenome, reset the epigenetics, actually change those biochemical marks to, to make it think that it's no longer an adult mature cell, but actually a very early embryonic-like cell. Uh, you know, so this is illustrated here. And those factors, there are four of them, uh, called the Yamanaka factors. And then so this has allowed us to really uh, study the epigenetic process and also maybe a source of stem cells. So, I'm a little frozen here. Uh-oh. Oops, there we go. And uh, this goes back to uh, a very uh, you know, famous illustration showed here, which goes to this model of, from uh, investigator uh, Dr. Waddington, in which what you're really doing is modeling embryonic development. So very early on, when you have in a developing embryo for embryonic stem cells, that cell is immature and pluripotent. And you can think of it as uh, uh, at the top of this diagram. Okay, and then uh, as it differentiates during development, it has these little values that it's gonna go and decide what kind of cell it can become, and then become a unipotent or mature cell, as illustrated here. In, in uh, embryonic development, that's called differentiation, which we have mentioned. What it's also doing, you could think of it, is changing what we call the epigenetic landscape. You know, what are those epigenetic marks that makes an immature cell allow it to become a more specialized cell. And from this, uh, you could think of this process of cellular reprogramming mimicking embryonic development. So now you're taking uh, a mature cell, a somatic cell like a fibroblast, reprogramming it, resetting the epigenomics into what we call an induced pluripotent stem cell, and then having the ability to take that step that uh, IPS cell and differentiate it back into the mature cells. So you're actually modulating the chemical processes on the DNA that makes a cell f going from immature to mature. Now, uh, 
My lab uh, you know, uh, uses iPSCs to study genetic diseases, and I'll just show you some of the examples of this technique where you could take a mature skin cell from a skin biopsy, and the picture here on the left is uh, magnified, so that little dark area right there is a few millimeters uh, based on a skin biopsy piece of skin, and then the cells would grow onto the dish, and then they become fibroblasts, which is a type of differentiated mature cell. Uh, it's it's uh, growing on the culture plate. So if you could uh, look carefully, these kind of spindle-like shapes are each a cell. And then uh, when you give it the Yaman Yamanaka factors, then you can convert this fibroblast into the iPSCs. And then after that, you can take those iPSC cells that mature and then directly dif uh, uh, spontaneously differentiate them into different mature cell types as shown here. Uh, as an example, ectoderm, it's a type of embryonic uh, tissue that uh, uh, is staining here. Again, these are cells growing on a slide and then stained chemically to identify what kind of cell is, is there. So these went from an immature state into a specialized cell. In the first column here, it's, it's a marker for early, early neurons, excuse me, or brain cells. The middle column shows a marker for endoderm tissue, which uh, can give rise to very early uh, cells such as liver. And then the third column in red here is a marker uh, for mesoderm, which can give rise to early cells such as smooth muscle. Uh, my lab also uh, I specialize in, in cardiomyocytes, so these, again, is a, a magnified image of those cells. The bright pink circle is the nucleus. And then we, you can also differentiate iPS cells into what we call multipotent stem cells, so, uh, uh, such as mesenchymal stem cells. And these can be then differentiated into different types of cells. And these, again, are magnified uh, differentiated cells stained with different chemicals in the first column. It identifies very immature uh, bone cells or osteoblasts. In the middle column, identifies uh, very uh, early adipocytes or fat cells. And finally, the last column shows staining for uh, cells or chondrocytes, which make up cartilage. So this uh, technique is quite powerful because now you could take any, or not any, you could take a somatic mature cell, convert it, or reset the epigenome and then have a source for uh, uh, mature cells. Now, as we go through this, we're gonna, I wanna give you an example of some of the treatments that are coming down the pipeline, or at least in the research realm. And we have talked about studying aging in terms of using uh, DNA methylation, like the methylation clock, uh, and several cell replication. Uh, you could also, study aging in the dish. Now, uh, another uh, way is to study patients. Now, uh, this is a slide showing a picture of, uh, uh, of a boy with a condition called hutchinson gilford progeria syndrome. And this is an early age aging disease. So uh, it's a very rare disorder. It's a genetic disorder that happens spontaneously. That is, it happens for the first time within the family. And for these children, within the first one or two years of life, uh, they appear normal. And you can see this little boy here at age one. And then around age two years of age, uh, they start having growth failure. That is, they don't grow normally, despite their eating fine. Uh, and then they start having a characteristic facial feature, as this little boy is shown here, in which the, uh, 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 the face is uh, appear small compared to the head. And then as the child gets older, you could see in the picture here how the facial features become more prominent. So it's considered a model for premature aging. And it's due to this gene called lamin AC, which makes a part of that nucleus and plays a role in epigenetics uh, processes. So, uh, there's another slide showing multiple uh, children with this disorder. It affects both males and females. And as listed here, some of the features that 
uh, these children develop uh, mimic uh, aging with hair loss, hearing loss, osteoporosis, or uh, weakening of the bones, muscle wasting, and they uh, uh, suffer from early death. Uh, the average lifespan is about 14 and a half years old. And typically that results from, uh, uh, from chronic diseases, such as atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries or strokes. Uh, now, uh, this particular condition, because it's a model for early aging, has had a lot of areas of research. And one of it was, de uh, was developing a mouse model uh, by this group in which they uh, changed the laminase C gene in the mouse uh, to, to mimic what you see in the patients. So in this slide over here is a normal mouse, what we call wild type. And you could see the size of the mouse over here and then also the shininess of the hair color. But when they've introduced that genetic mutation in the laminase C gene to give the mouse this progerious syndrome, then you could see uh, this is a mouse below that's affected that is uh, the same age, but you can see how small it is. And then when you look at the hair, uh, you could see uh, the hair loss and some other uh, changes. And when you look at the survival of this mouse, uh, it's associated, the mutation is uh, associated with early death. So this is a survival curve showing uh, the age. Now mice live about uh, one to two years of age typically. So this is measured in days and then the percent survival. So those uh, wild type or normal mice, those mice without the genetic mutation, sort of all survive way past uh, one year of age. But those here as signified with the minus minus or having the genetic mutation in red here, this line shows how uh, roughly after uh, about two to three months, uh, then the survival uh, drops quite readily. So it mimics what we typically see in the patients. Okay? Now animal models are important because it allows us to study processes such as these. Now I bring this up because uh, several years ago, uh, a group uh, down in San Diego actually had a very uh, dramatic experiment in which the question is, if you can take these Yamanaka factors and reprogram a mature cell, that is an age cell, with all these epigenetic changes, and convert it back to an immature cell, uh, uh, you know, can you do that actually uh, uh, not just in the dish, but actually in vivo, that is within an animal system? So this group, what they did was take this progeria mouse, as shown here, and then set up a very complicated system in which uh, the cells of the mouse were reprogrammed using those four factors. Now, it's important to note that if you just give these four factors uh, to any animal model system, the risk is uh, you know, uh, early death and cancer. So what they had to do was actually do something called partial reprogramming, cyclic. So the cells actually were activated to give the four factors at a limited time, and then it was turned off, okay? Uh, uh, because when you uh, try to reset the landscape of these cells, you don't want, of course, the cell to actually give up its identity, you know, set it all the way back, uh, you know, so uh, they partially reprogrammed. And what they, what they did uh, was quite dramatic because when they did this, the progeria mouse, shown in this side over here. On the left, the one uh, 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 that uh, was reprogrammed, uh, really many of the features improved, that is, were rescued. Uh, these are mice of the same age. You could see, again, the different of the hair color. And then, again, survival over here. Uh, this is a complicated slide because just the way they administered the reprogramming factors uh, had to be uh, considered. But the most important thing here, again, this is a survival curve showing the age in weeks below, and then present survival, uh, that uh, in the blue line, those mice with the progeria mutation and uh, subjected to partial reprogram had significant improvement in survival. 
So this was uh, you know, a proof of concept that if you modify your epigen uh, genome within the cell in a living animal, that you could actually reset it and rejuvenate uh, the cells and rescue the phenotypes associated with aging. Now, the other thing they did was, well, you know, that's the progeria mouse model. What about the mice at age? Does that have any effect on them? So they took some older mice and then did a similar thing. Uh, now, these are mice, normal mice do not have the lambda mutation, they're older. And then they looked at the response to injury. As I mentioned, you need tissue homeostasis. So as you get older, it's really hard to bounce back from illness, from injury, uh, you know, compared to when you're younger. You know, uh, so what they did, they took the older mice and then subjected it to very specific types of injury to mimic uh, some of the chronic diseases that we see with aging. One is diabetes, so when they injured the pancreas uh, and then subject mice to this uh, reprogramming, now these are older mice, normal mice, uh, these mice would respond better uh, uh, given the reprogramming. That is, uh, this is a model in which they're essentially trying to mimic diabetes, chronic diabetes, which involves the pancreas. So when uh, the mice were challenged with glucose, uh, the partial reprogramming actually allowed them to bounce back. That is, the pancreas regenerated better than those uh, mice that uh, did not undergo the treatment. The same thing with the muscle. Uh, uh, they took these older mice, they subjected them to muscle injury, and then those mice that were partially reprogrammed were able to uh, respond. That is, their muscle regenerated better than those uh, without the treatment. So again, this was one of the proof of concepts that perhaps uh, using methods like this, partial reprogramming and resetting your epigenetics, perhaps this may be a possible treatment to address aging. Great. And so just to piggyback on what Mike sort of mentioned, although a lot of those methods are sort of in development, uh, there are sort of more practical things that you could do now to help slow the aging process. And so this is a, a schematic from the same paper that I mentioned before about epigenetic drift across different species. And just to give you a flavor of what uh, was done is they uh, had mice and monkeys that were given ad lib diets versus uh, caloric restriction, restricted diets, okay, so restricted eating. And what you can see is their actual age versus the predicted age based on DNA methylation um, sort of doesn't have a clear impact or change in the animals fed sort of ad lib diets. But when you have this caloric restriction, you can see that at the level of the epigenome in this epigenetic clock, you can actually see a reduction in the predicted age in both these uh, 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 animal species. And so this idea, you could hit the next slide, I think, um, is really sort of, um, you know, uh, emerging as a, as a common sort of theme where the idea is on the side of the epigenetic clock, there are these things that will sort of lead to accelerated aging uh, and certain risk factors like smoking and drinking and other lifestyle choices versus having a healthy lifestyle. Um, where working out and exercising good diet can actually uh, lead to um, sort of a healthy aging. Um, and so, you know, as, uh, uh, so as Tim had mentioned, you know, w one thing we were pointing out some many of the, the basic signs of epigenetics of research. However, you know, of course, these are many ways, uh, you know, these are avenues, potential avenues, you know. So this, uh, we wanted to end this talk just as a reminder for all of us Actually, the best advice is having a healthy uh, lifestyle because there's actually many research, like the one that Tim showed with the caloric restriction, that does make a difference in your epigenetic, epigenetics and uh, lifespan uh, extension. And there's a long list of things that are actually being tested right now. Uh, one of the first FDA trials just happened about two years ago in which they had uh, individuals. Uh, this was a cohort that they were following of uh, uh, individuals between 40 and 60. 
uh, these individuals had a very uh, loose diet. That is, they didn't uh, really watch what they eat. Uh, they uh, uh, watched a lot of TV and did not exercise. Okay? So you know, I probably could have been in that cohort. Anyway, so they had an FDA a trial in which they randomized them and then kept track uh, did the DNA methylation clock first to see what their epigenetic status was, and then they randomized them uh, to have a treatment group which consisted of diet and exercise, okay? And then the other one which did not. And after about three months and nine months when they rechecked the DNA methylation status, it actually improved. Okay, you know, so there is, uh, you know, some direct evidence and there are many studies coming down the pipeline moving away from some of the theoretical concepts that we talked about and the animal models to actually patients because now there's a very good way to measure aging with the DNA methylation clock and many different lifestyle uh, changes that you could do right now to implement and see if there's a difference. Okay, uh, okay, so uh, can we stop the hands of time? Well, as we had mentioned, it's very promising approaches. Over the last couple of decades, we've really learned a lot about aging. The molecular changes, the, the, the uh, cellular changes, the epigenetics. Epigenetic changes is a very uh, proven hallmark of aging. And then now we're getting into the stage where actually, uh, you know, uh, not only we can measure, but maybe we could intervene whether it's something like partial reprogramming or environmental changes, you know, these are very promising, uh, such as additional breakthroughs uh, you know, are on the horizon. So again, we just want to emphasize, and as a physician, I just again want to mention that lifestyle changes is the best, uh, we, uh, you know, a, a very good approach and, uh, you know, as the stem cell techniques are being developed. And uh, we just want to show this. We stop the clock, and we thank you. So uh, all apologies, sir, but I don't like your prescription. <laughs> of I, I, want, I want a pill. I, I want a pharmaceutical. So what can, we, what can we look forward to assuming that we're not going to exercise and we want to eat our In-N-Out burgers? You know, uh, uh, are we doomed? No, we're not doomed, OK? You know, and this is, uh, when Tim and I was discussing what to present, this is a, a very broad, it's a rich area of re active research. You know, certainly aging is a big topic, not just with academic centers of pharmaceuticals, but one of the big things, uh, as Tim presented, was the DNA methylation clock, which is an important finding because now we can actually measure, uh, you know, aging uh, quantitatively. So right now there are actually many, uh, I, I will not mention specifics or what drugs, but there are active trials for drug regimens monitoring people with the DNA methylation clock to see if it makes a difference, okay? So those are on the horizon, you know, and we'll just have to wait, okay? Um, so I think it's, it's related to what you guys were just talking about, and I'm sorry if I missed it earlier. So I think you made it pretty clear that the methylation decreases with aging. Um, is low methylation associated with diseases or causing diseases, something like that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And so what, what we showed previously is there is a global hypomethylation that happens, but really it's a little more complicated what happens because in the genome you do have regions that are highly methylated and regions that are lowly methylated. Oftentimes promoter gene regions can have, you know, no methylation present. And actually what you see during the aging process is that the hypermethylated regions lose methylation, but the hypomethylated regions actually start to gain methylation. And so in that sense, you can actually have gene dysregulation within the promoter regions as methylation is being hypermethylated there and usually associated with the silencing of gene expression. Um, but then I think it's also interesting in, you know, in other regulatory regions that are highly methylated, um, you do see losses in methylation. And I, I think those could have an impact on um, sort of misregulation of genes as well. But it can be kind of context specific or gene specific, um, but you do see both uh, scenarios happening, but largely the genome is hi highly methylated. And so globally you see a loss in methylation. Yeah. 
So I want to follow up on that. So like mm -hmm. chair's prerogative kind of thing. In lay person's language, right? Mm -hmm. So you're losing methylation mm -hmm. with aging. What is that doing for the cell, right? So is it yeah. that the cell is just making too many genes now and so they're not working together? Is it inefficient from an energetics point of view because there are changes in energy metabolism that mm. happen with ages? Like, so why does, it, yeah. why does it matter? Is it just that you have a finely tuned orchestra and now they're not all playing together? You know, I think that, that last point can be a very big um, thing that we do observe. So for example, there have been studies that looked at DNA methylation in muscle stem cells as we age, you have sort of a, an increased variation in the expression of genes in those stem cells with the also changes in methylation that you observe. And so it seems like these cells are unable to regulate their you know, genome and ultimately the expression of genes throughout stem cell populations as well as they were when they were younger. And that could cause changes in um, the sort of uh, differentiation capacity or efficiency and ultimately stem cell exhaustion um, that, that we sort of mentioned earlier. So and then, do I have a question from the audience? Cool. Oh, good, you've got one more. My question is, um, you were saying that, you know, if you have a good diet and exercise and all those little words that you had, so are you specific with, I mean, are, do you measure like, well, if this person is a vegetarian or, med I mean, are you being more specific besides just all those words that you had up? Uh, that's a very good question, and no, uh, uh, you know, a complicated question, you know, because aging uh, is a complicated process, as we know. People age differently, the diets are different, the, the cells and tissues actually age differently, you know. So until we get that magic pill, you know, uh, or we have specific ways to address aging, you know, I guess the, always the general recommendation, and not just for aging, but for healthy lifestyle, is diet and exercise, stress reduction, uh, uh, sleep, uh, you know, because those are things that, uh, as you perturb your system, you know, that's what think is gonna be changing whatever it is, whether it's associated with disease or aging, okay? So, but some of those questions are very, very good, and I think we're moving towards uh, again, you hear the word of personalized medicine because you could see the research is very broadly done from a conceptual basis, hypotheses, animal models, and then cohorts. Like the cohort I said with the uh, first FDA approved, which is two years ago, it's a big thing, but that was only a very small study and very limited, okay? You know, so until we get uh, you know, enough resources and focus on, re on aging and how that really matters individually. I think that's when we're gonna be able to address it, something like that, okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about specific mushrooms. Yeah. Uh, Mike, I'm, can you repeat that question just so we know that oh, people online you know, so, are able uh, to You know, there's also other, you know, interventions like, uh, uh, medicinal medicines, um, other kind of interventional or integrative approaches. Those are all very qu good questions, but uh, uh, I'd have to go back to see what's in the literature. You know, what uh, we wanted to focus on was the epigenetics. And at this stage, you know, these are very broad studies in which they're looking at, you know, some of the, uh, the low-hanging fruit, the obvious things that are often recommended just for general health, like, uh, you know, uh, decreased screen time and, you know, fruits and vegetables, caloric intake. But eventually, I think we're going to have to have a broader picture and see what kind of environmental uh, stressors or interventions, including things like that. Okay. But so to, I'd, to I'd, your guys' point, having this methylation clock gives a tool where you can ask those questions, right? Absolutely. Whereas even a few years ago, you didn't have a tool to be able to figure that out. Yeah, but I'd have to see in the literature to see uh, uh, what specifically, because you, we do have the tools in terms of the cell models, the measurements, and the hypothesis that you could uh, you know, imagine how to address that. But then actually taking that, even from an animal model to a person, is you know, gonna take a lot of effort. Okay. But, 
So we have a kind of a natural follow-up in one of the Q&A questions that has come in online, and you just touched on it briefly, so I, I want you to expand. And that's whether different cells and tissues are differentially susceptible, right? Do they age differently? And then the follow-up question, which comes in the line after that, is whether that might be related to changes in the incidence of cancer, susceptibility to cancer of different cells and tissues with aging. Yeah, just, just speaking a, a, upon the, the question of, um, you know, do different tissues age at different rates? And actually, that's where a lot of the work with epigenetic clock development has gone, actually, with uh, finding, I, identifying sort of clocks for each specific tissue. Um, and so you might find actually different epigenetic clocks in the blood versus the pancreas or the kidney. Actually, we have, have some collaboration with um, Marcelo Wood at, at UCI looking at uh, hippocampus aging, and our hope is to find a DNA methylation clock specific to that tissue so we can make predictions about cognitive decline actually throughout the aging process. Um, the, the second question. Uh, Susceptibility I, to cancer, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I think that's a great hypothesis. There probably is certainly a, a, an association to susceptibility, tissue-specific susceptibility to certain cancers um, that are associated with those sort of rates of decline. In fact, a lot of the epigenetic landscape that you see um, during the aging process mimics somewhat that of the, the cancer epigenome as well. Um, and so there is some, some link there. Yeah. So there's, uh, I think, an, another interesting question that came in online. Um, from Eric Swanson, I think, is about kind of stacking up and comparing the relative importance of methylation status and this demethylation or hypomethylation process that happens with aging to something people have probably read about in the past in Newsweek and Time Magazine, which is telomere shortening, right? And you touched on it, both of you, in your talks, but could you just briefly explain what telomere shortening is in the context of your answer also? Yeah, so, so telomere shortening um, essentially is the result of what's known as the in-replication problem. So uh, as DNA replicates, half of the genome has to be replicated in what's called Okazaki fragments, and that leads to a problem at the end of your genome where there's not enough DNA left to make a new strand of DNA, and so um, the cell, to sort of uh, create a blunt end of DNA, will chop some of that that, that end of the chromosome off. Stem cells express telomerase, which are enzymes that can build back those strands, but as we age, the levels of telomerase actually decline, and our ability, in, 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 even in somatic cells, they really start to sort of shorten, um, leading to genomic instability. These ends of the chromosome protect the genome from these other, these chromosome instabilities, essentially. Um, I think when it comes to making predictions on age, telomere shortening versus DNA methylation, I, I think that DNA methylation has been shown to be more accurate in those predictions, and so that's why there is a lot of excitement actually about this as a metric versus telomere shortening, but there are certainly, um, you know, companies that will give you some prediction based on telomere length as well. Yeah. So, um I mean, an interesting question that also is posed on, online. Um, I'm going to ask it in two different, two different ways, and then there's a, a great um, sort of ethics question maybe to wrap up with at, at the end here. I'll give you guys one more chance before we close up to ask anyone who's present in the room. So that is, um, and I'm going to give you two sides of the coin. For current cell therapeutics that we're looking at, you know, cell transplantation, for example, is it possible that one of the mechanisms, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but one of, me one of the mechanisms of zo those cell therapeutics has to do with actually changing the cells in the body in terms of their methylation status, right? So that's part one. And part two, which I'm adding on to the questions that came in online, is do we need to worry about for cell therapeutics monitoring what their methylation status is? Might that be related to the efficacy of a population or how we have to maintain it in a dish, something that we need to think about if we're going to be doing transplants for spinal cord injury, for Alzheimer's, for Parkinson's, for diabetes, should we be monitor monitoring that piece? Is, is it important, probably, in your view, towards function? 
Yeah, those are great questions. The first one, remind me of the first one again, just briefly. <laughs> it was... I'm not, at least I'm not Peter. I didn't ask you like five <laughs> questions all in one sentence. So... <laughs> I had it, but then I lost. <laughs> the first question is, um, it, could one mechanism of what a cell therapeutic does right. be to reprogram methylation status in its target tissue, like where yeah, you're transplanting? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, and I think, I mean, I think that speaks quite a bit to what Mike presented. Yeah, it was interesting with the, uh, the research from the uh, uh, progeria mouse and the partial reprogramming. Now, one of the points is they're actually uh, uh, rejuvenating all the cells. So it's set up genetically so that every single cell of that mouse is actually having the four factors. So, so looking at the data there, you can't really say, well, was it actually stem cells that are being targeted and being rejuvenated, or was it the other cells, okay? What was very interesting was just the same group just very recently had a paper uh, in which they looked at those muscles and then actually targeted specifically uh, the muscle cells. And it was interesting that what happened was the muscle cells have very specific uh, stem cells called satellite cells. And in those mice that had rejuvenated muscle due to the reprogramming, it was those stem cells were uh, much more active, but it wasn't because of the reprogramming. It was actually from the surrounding cells that was actually contributing and activating the endogenous uh, you know, uh, muscle stem cells. So given that, you could imagine that you know, as I mentioned with some of the aging process with the adult stem cells, all these things can happen to, to change that. We also have to remember, this is not an isolated system where you're just trying to activate the stem cells or replace the stem cells. You really have to pay attention to the local environment and also the entire body system. And that's what we really don't understand. We can, uh, you know, spend a lot of time looking at certainly one of the major players, you know, in our focus, which is the stem cell. But what about the environment that it's in, those cells that actually have to maintain the stem cells, or in this case, activate it, and then also those circling factors in the entire body, okay? Which there is other, and we didn't have any uh, more time, but there's other evidence of circulating factors. You know, so it's a very complicated system, and certainly if you're gonna transplant, uh, you know, the changes could actually be happening to the surrounding cells. So I just want to remind everybody of kind of the coolness of all this when it comes to stem cells, right? Which is kind of embedded in what, what you guys have been talking to us all about this evening, but I think is easy to get lost on the audience. And that is every tissue in your body has a population of stem cells right now, right? And so on one hand, we think about ways to use stem cells, to transplant them, to improve function by making more of whatever is there that's become dysfunctional or missing. But embedded in this is the idea that we could wake up those stem cell populations that are in an aging tissue or in a diseased tissue and use that as a means to repair, right? Never transplanting anything at all. And how cool would that be down the road? And some of this research that we've been talking about this evening is gonna be really important towards that process. So we've talked before in these meetings about the idea that you've got a really large base or pyramid that we're stacked upon that's all the basic science research that leads up towards the translational path. And this is a part of what you've been hearing tonight. So on that note of coolness, I wanna ask one last question that um, has come in from the audience. And that's um, from Rick Robertson, who's an emeritus, uh, oh no, maybe it's yeah. from Sid, yeah. Uh, who's an emeritus faculty here, very active participant in the Stem Cell Center um, and engaged in the School of Medicine for many years. And he asks uh, from, Jeff Goldblum's character, right, in Jurassic Park, because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. And so should we be thinking about reversing aging? Or is there an ethical implication to that that's on the con side of the game? I'll let them struggle for a minute. And then Lee, since you're here, you should probably chime in. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, you know, it's, it's a good question. I think it, it's society's to, to be decided in some sense. I think from my perspective, I'm very interested in preventative tissue engineering. I got into science really uh, to build new organs when organs go bad, you know, things like dialysis and kidney failure. It's not so robust, you know, in terms of the long-term um, survivability of those patients. And so, you know, I think about sort of the age-related disease aspect of it. And, 
Um, you know, if it's natural, do we treat it? Well, you know, I think we, you know, all want to sort of extend that health span. And, and for me, it's really about health span more than, more than lifespan. And so that's kind of where I'm, I'm at with, with the debate. Uh, you know, that's a tough question because that's why in the beginning I wanted to bring up the question, is it, a, is it aging a disease? You know, because if you call it a disease, then we should treat it, okay? But this, of course, uh, one of the reasons I like to participate in these community talks is because to hear what the community thinks about this, okay? Because these are real active issues. You could see the research going, and there is a big push, uh, certainly to, uh, to address those chronic diseases which are associated with aging, okay? But ethically, you know, there are some very good points here, okay? So I, it's very hard for me to answer that. As a scientist, I would agree with Tim because I'm looking and as a doctor to you know, uh, preserve life, be healthy, and then push the lifespan so we can decrease the incidence of those chronic diseases, okay? But as a society, you know, the question is, you know, what about the bigger issues, okay? Uh, that's not for me to answer. I think this is a discussion between uh, individuals, uh, the, the community scientists, because this is very important on where we direct the research, okay? It's very easy to see the, the expected life expectancy and say, hey, let's push it, okay? Uh, the other thing uh, I should mention is, is there a maximum lifespan? You know, uh, that is an open question too. Uh, we could have these efforts and try to extend the lifespan, but there might be a limit to that, okay? You know, so I'm not really sure. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? You know, is aging, a problem that we really need to direct our efforts to, you know, uh, extend life, or you know, I don't know. Lee Turner, I'm a new faculty uh, building a bioethics center here at UCI, and I enjoyed your talk, really appreciated it, thank you. Um, I mean, just to kind of pick up on the question that was posed, you know, just because you can do something, should you do something? I, I'm guessing a lot of us would kind of quickly turn to the answer being no, that just because you have the technical capacity to do something doesn't automatically mean you know, that you, you should do it. That said, I mean, you know, turning to the focus of your presentation, you know, what, when it comes to the question of, well, if we could develop therapeutic interventions for children with progeria, for example, you know, our response to that might be different than other aspects of human life. So I think a kind of a case-based, very sort of specific focused way of looking at this might be a helpful way to go. Just to kind of throw in my own two cents here, I mean, I found myself thinking at the end of your presentation where you kind of moved to the language of lifestyle choices, you know, I found that illuminating and helpful, but I also found myself wondering, I mean, do you think it might be helpful to complement that with a kind of, you know, public health perspective or population health perspective? Because, you know, part of your presentation included discussion of environment and there's the environment for cells, but there's also our environment you know, the world that we live in. And if, you know, your goal as a society is to try and have healthy aging for your population, for individuals, there are a lot of policy things that you can do, you know, for your society. And if you have strictly a biomedical, you know, highly technical orientation, you could, you could end up with a scenario where you're kind of pouring more and more resources for less and less in terms of your gains, kind of like tiny little increments at the end of life where you're not really getting very much for your extraordinary allocation of resources. Whereas if you focus more on, you know, making sure that there was healthy food available for most of your society, or there's, you know, maternity leave, paternity leave, quality education available to everyone regardless of income. Um, pardon me? Clean air, you're like very concerned. I mean, I mean, those might be sort of like well-established policy measures and public health measures that they don't stave off aging, they don't stave off death, but they might, you know, for a population overall improve kind of, you know, healthy aging over time. Um, so it might be that there's sort of different disciplinary lenses and perspectives. The concern I have with lifestyle choices is it can be a bit too individualistic and make it seem as though it's kind of like it's all about your choices, like do you have the potato chips or the apple? But there are a lot of things that we can do to kind of like make that apple a possibility and make the potato chips a bit less of a, pause, of, of, of a possibility. And so, you know, maybe that's a, a compliment to your concluding remarks. Any other questions or 
comments, discussion from the audience? Because following on from Lee's comments, I, I would just throw out the idea that, of course, the environment that we live in is going to influence what our health index is, right? Or what was the phrase that you used, Tim? Epigenetic clock. Yeah, epigenetic, well. Do, Biological age. Health span, that's where I was going, which is much cooler than the other two words that you just said. <laughs> no, health span, right? Be, and we know that. We know that pesticides and lead and toxic things in the environments and you know where we are with climate change is going to influence probably what our health span is. It will be an interesting question how that feeds back to our stem cells and the biology of those stem cells. Thank you guys all for your attention. I know that we went um, kind of long tonight, but I appreciate all the questions. Thanks again for coming. Thanks particularly um, to Dr. Downing and Dr. Zaragoza for being here tonight. And um, have a good evening. Round of applause. I can't do that well.